Hey guys, it's Julie here. Welcome back to 3D Fundamentals Tutorial 18. This video is going to be the last one in the shader arc, and it's going to be a fun one because we're talking about specular highlights, and they're very sexy. Uh, but we'll get into that in a second. First, a little bit of Mia Culpa. So, in the last video, I kind of told you guys that I messed up a, a little bit, teensy little bit, because I forgot to renormalize my interpolated normals in the pixel shader. So, I did a little spiel about that. I told you guys, you know, try to guess what my mistake was. And then someone came out and pointed out a much worse mistake that I missed. Just a little typo. Uh, so, in the Fong point effect here, we've got our calculation of the attenuation based on distance. And it should be adding these three terms, the linear, the quadratic, and the constant. But we see here we're actually multiplying the linear and the quadratic together that's going to give us a lot more attenuation than we expected. So, change that to a plus. That's very important. And of course, here I put in the, uh, the renormalization. I also put that in here. So now we should be all square, good to go. Of course, if you notice anything else, be sure to let me know. I would be interested. But anyways, let's get on to the topic of today, which is specular highlights. So what is that? Well, let's let's do a little quick recap of the kind of lighting that we're doing so far. So the two types of lighting we have so far is diffuse and ambient. Uh, diffuse is when light comes out of a light source, hits some object, and then is scattered out in all directions. And some of those scattered light rays enter the eye, and this is how we see the object. That's diffuse light. Uh, now, with just diffuse light, for example, if we were to look at the object from this side, it would disappear, basically, because no light can hit this surface from this light source, and therefore no light is going to come off of it and reach our eyes. But, obviously that's not very realistic. Inside of a room like this, you would see the object from the other side, it just wouldn't be as bright. Why is that? Well, because light would bounce off of the walls, then hit the object, and then that would be scattered out, and someone enter your eye. So that's ambient light. We basically fake this bouncing by saying, okay, there's a certain amount of light that's just in the room, and we light up all, um, all triangles, all polygons of our objects with that minimum light level. And then we add to that extra light depending on the, uh, the diffuse, the direct heat of light. That's how we light our objects so far. Now, with this diffuse, you might be thinking, or you might have thought in the past, that, well, if the light hits the uh, surface at this angle, like here, it's just going to bounce off with this angle here, which is the same as the instance. The angle of incidence should be the same as the angle of exit. And so none of it is going to hit the eye. It's all going to bounce off in a line like this. Or this one is going to bounce off like this, or whatever. I don't know. Well, this one will bounce off like this. So you would expect it to do this sort of thing. But with diffuse lighting, and with most surfaces that you're going to deal with, if the surface were perfectly flat, yes, all the light rays would reflect with the proper angle like this. But most surfaces aren't perfectly flat, they have micro features on them, which means when the light rays hit them, depending on where it hits, you know, it might bounce off like this, or another light ray slightly off might bounce back in the opposite direction, and so in general, diffuse surfaces, we say they scatter like this. Because either they have micro features or something called um, subsurface scattering, which is where the light rays penetrate in somewhat into the surface and then bounce off something that's inside. So depending on those characteristics, most of your surfaces are going to be diffuse and this is going to play a big role. But here's the thing. Most surfaces, they aren't just all completely diffuse are all completely reflective. There's some kind of mix between these two. Think about like a uh, little bit of polished stone, right? It's not, a, it's not a pure mirror, but it's also got a bit of shininess, a little bit of reflectiveness. Uh, or think of something like just normal plastic, right? Plastic has a little bit of shine to it, you know, depending on the type of plastic. Think about the glints that you often see at the edges of metallic objects. Those glints are actually the reflected image of the light source reflecting directly off the surface and into your eye. So you're seeing the reflected image of the light source. So what does that look like in a diagram? Well, in general, you're going to have some surface. It's got a normal. 
you've got your light source, could be a point, could also be a direction, we'll get into that later. But you've got a light source, so if your vector to the light source is like this, the vector of the reflected light ray is going to be looking like this. This angle here is going to match this angle here. And now, if that reflected light ray happens to enter the eye of the viewer, then the viewer is going to see a glint at this point here. That's the glint of the, the reflected light source. So all we want to do is see if this vector here, when it's reflected in the normal, if it enters the viewing position, and if so, then we want to add extra intensity to this point that we're rendering on the screen. Now the question remains, once we have our reflected light vector, how exactly do we calculate the specular highlight? Because think about it, if we calculate it as only get a highlight when this reflected vector intersects with the viewing point, the viewing position, well, the viewing position is an infinitesimally small point in space. So the chances of this actually intersecting are almost zero. It's never going to happen. Uh, so what we actually want is we want a bit of range or tolerance in which we will see the specular reflection. So we can take a angle between the reflected vector and the viewing uh, vector, and we can say, well, if this angle is zero, obviously you want to see a nice big um, specular reflection here because we're exactly intersecting with the viewing position. But if, as this angle gets smaller, we want a quick drop off of specular. So when this angle gets, you know, to maybe like 10 degrees, we want to see almost no specular. But we want it to quickly rise to full specular when it approaches zero. So what kind of mathematical formula is going to give us this behavior? Well, we know that we can do r hat dot v hat, and that'll be equal to cos phi, which is the cos of the angle between r and v. And that's sort of close to what we want. Let's take a look at that. So I'm graphing cos x. This is going to be phi. And if we look at phi here, well, we see that we get a nice gradual roll off to 90 degrees. Uh, and that's not really what we want. We want to reject this guy very steeply. Now, what we can do for that, since cos x, cos phi is always going to be less than 1, if we raise it to some power, we are going to be dropping it off quite quickly as it falls off from 1. So if we can raise it to higher powers, like let's try 60, we see now we get a very quick drop off. And it drops off to basically zero well before 90 degrees. And this is what we want. So this is going to be our function to get our specular out of our two vectors. We're just going to do the dot product between them and then raise that to some power. So there's the basics of it. Now, here comes the fun part. We've got to calculate this reflected vector given our nor surface normal and our light vector. So this is just a little bit of vector manipulation. It's a fun little uh, exercise if you want to try it on your own. Uh, but I'm going to, you know, obviously derive it out here for you. So we've got this vector L. If we flip it, if we negate it, we're going to get a vector that looks like this, right? And we can call this one negative L. Okay? Now let's do another thing. Let's take the dot product of L and the normal. So here is the, uh, the line of the normal. And if we take the dot product, we're just projecting into that line. So we're going to get this length here. And then if we scale the normal by that length that we calculated, we're going to get a new vector like this. And let's call this guy W. Doesn't really matter what we call him. So we've got negative L, we've got W. We want to find R. How are we going to do that? Let's draw a vertical line from R down to L, negative L here. So if we add this vector, let's call this vector U. If we add U to negative L, we get R. So all we need to do is figure out U because negative L is easy to find. So what is U? Let's draw a little line here. So we can see that U is a vertical vector and it is actually going to be twice as long as W, which is the projection of L into this normal and then we scale the normal by that amount. So u is actually equal to 2 times w. And there we go. We've actually got the solution because we know that if we add negative l to u, we get r. So we can say r is equal to 2w minus 
L. W is equal to L dot N hat times N hat. And if we put it all together, R is equal to 2 times L dot N hat times N hat minus L. And there you go. You have got the formula for your reflected vector. It's not super complicated if you just look through the steps. It might be a little tricky to derive from yourself, but when you see someone else doing it, I think you'll be able to nod your head and say, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I see where it comes from. So that's the math. Now let's get on to the code. So we have added a new effect here, as we always do, and it is called specular Fo phone. Why is it called phone point scene? Chili? Anyways, doesn't matter. Uh, we want the effect, the fong point effect. Here we go. And it's going to be very similar to the normal point effect. Um, all the, the vertex shader should be the same. It's just down here in the pixel shader, we're going to add some new stuff. So to get started here, what I did is I renormalized the surface normal because it's going to be used a whole bunch of different places. I don't want to have to renormalize it multiple times. So I get the renormalized surface normal. I get the vector to the light. That's the same. Calculate the attenuation. That is the same, and it is fixed here as well. And then we calculate the light intensity for the diffuse. Here is where the new happiness happens. So we calculate our W, which again is the dot product between our light vector and the normal, and then we multiply that scalar by the normal again to get W. The re reflection vector is just W times 2 minus the light vector. And then we calculate the specular highlight intensity, which is going to be what I, what I showed you, right? It is going to be our normalized reflection dot the uh, view position, which is just our world position, because our view position is at the origin, right? So our view position is always at the origin, so we just use a uh, vector to the world position of the point that we are rendering. So we dot view position, view vector, I should say, dot the view vector with the reflected light vector. We make sure that we don't, we reject negative values and we raise that to some power. We call that specular power. And uh, so we raise it to the power. We can scale it by specular intensity. And then we multiply that by the, uh, basically the power of the light and the color of the light, which is light diffused. And that gives us our specular highlight. Now the specular intensity and specular power are basically just magic constants that you can control yourself in order to change the properties of the light and more specifically of the material. So different powers will give you different effects. If you have a higher power, you're going to have a sharper reflection. You're going to have a faster cutoff. Um, whereas if you have a lower power, your reflection is going to have a much more gradual roll off. And that means it's going to be uh, more spread out and more fuzzy. So you want a high specular power for objects like chrome, and you want a low specular power for objects like maybe a kind of matte plastic or something like that. And then you can control the intensity just to control the brightness of the yeah, specular highlight. We'll play around with these values in a little bit. Now one thing you might have noticed is we have actually put a negative in here. And that is because, remember I told you that uh, our viewing vector our view position is always going to be zero. And our viewing vector is basically just taking um, the vector from zero to the point that we're rendering. So our viewing vector is going in the opposite direction than what we derived. So we've got to add a negative in there to uh, take that into account. But when you do that, then all you're going to do is as normal, you're going to add all of your components together. Here we're adding diffuse plus our ambient plus our additional specular, saturate that, multiply by 255, and there you go. Bob is your uncle. And when we do this, let me tell you, it looks pretty dang sexy. So here it is, in all its glory. Uh, let's see if I can uh, rotate this a little more. Oh yeah. So you can see specular highlights definitely coming into play here, here, here. Uh, look at how much detail that uh, illuminates on the ear here. One of the main themes of this series that I've been trying to uh, get across all these videos is the idea of, you know, visual cues that allow our brain to see 2D 
image as 3D. And one of those visual cues, these specular highlights can really accentuate a lot of fine detail in a model, and that allows our brain to get a better understanding of the exact topology. So here it is, our beautiful shiny girl. And uh, if you don't think this is pretty damn sexy, then I don't know, maybe, maybe computer graphics just ain't your thing. I'm just saying. Now for this effect, I set the specular power to 30, but you could turn it down. You could say, ah, let's set it down to 10. And if you do that, it's gonna look a little different. And the idea here is we, but with 30, that gave us a very glossy material. But if you set it down to 10, you can see that the, the reflections, the specular highlights here, they're a little duller. They're not quite as on point. Let's turn it down to 6, and we'll set the specular intensity now down to, let's say, 0.45. And uh, so now we're looking at an object that is mostly matte. Well, maybe not mostly. We'd have to turn down the intensity even further to make it more matte. But you can see it doesn't look as shiny. It looks a little more velvety than shiny. So playing with these values can give you different materials, different properties. They look and feel different. Burnished steel is going to have a much lower power than polished chrome. It's also going to have a lower intensity. Now a couple things I just want to mention here. First of all, uh, obviously, like I said, these specular highlights do a lot to uh, accentuate fine details in the model, and that is especially true for things like normal maps. With you, when you have specular highlights with normal maps, they're going to really accentuate the fine features in the normal map, so it's a nice little uh, combination there. We're doing our specular effect here, we're doing it with a point light, but it works perfectly fine with a directional light as well. No. Uh, no problems there at all. You can also use specular highlighting with uh, per vertex shading, uh, but it doesn't look as good, uh, especially if your models don't have very fine geometry. So generally you want to be using your specular highlights together with per pixel shading uh, in most cases. But there you have it, specular highlights. And this, like I said, this is the end of the shader arc of 3D fundamentals. Uh, of course, this isn't the end of, this isn't all you can do with shaders. This is only the very tip of the iceberg, just the, the basic vanilla stuff. Um, there's way more effects and interesting, cool things you can do with shaders, but uh, that's going to be a story that we're going to explore later on, perhaps in hardware 3D. For right now, I think this is enough. This is the fundamentals of shaders. Now we're going to be moving on to the final phase of 3D Fundamentals, we're going to talk about some important topics that we've been avoiding up until now. Stuff like clipping, stuff like projection matrix, all that fun stuff. But until then, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button, it helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more 3D Fundamentals.